Hello and welcome to The Stand with Eamon Dunphy. Now, on his recent visit to Canada, uh, Leo Varadkar, our new Taoiseach, said that the uh, next Dáil session and the new year will be uh, dominated to some extent by the campaign to repeal the Eighth Amendment. Uh, this will be a referendum and it may well follow uh, with legislation. This is a most divisive and emotive issue and I'm joined in studio by Maria Steen who is a spokesperson for uh, the pro-life um, lobby and a spokesperson for the uh, Iona Institute which is I think Maria is fair to say a Catholic think tank. No, you're wrong. Okay. <laughs> Everybody thinks that it is, but yeah. actually we're a Christian ah. uh, think tank. So we have a broader range of um, members and people who are involved and we have a broader base appeal rather than specifically Catholic as such. Um, it is something that's often repeated in the media yeah, no. without kind of questioning, but actually we are. We have a, um, a former Church of Ireland bishop as well as a patron uh, of uh, the Institute. And is the Institute concerned with um, the solely with the issue of abortion no. or with matters of concern uh, across all religions it, it yeah well primarily christian re religions or uh, re christian i suppose um values although we do have support from non-christians both from um jewish muslim and those with kind of atheist or no faith background depending on the topic so we also discuss things such as um the right to state-funded denominational education uh, the place and value of marriage in society and also um, of freedom of religion and the importance that people of faith, uh, the important kind of civic role that they can provide for society in debate and so on. And we provide a forum uh, w within which to debate. So we organize lectures yes. and invite people to come along, listen and have questions and answer sessions and things like that. And we live in a growing secular society. Um, I think that's fair to say, yes. Almost Certainly in this part of the world. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and that's, I mean, how difficult does that make advocacy for, um, you know, what were traditional uh, Christian values on all kinds of things, such as um, gay rights, uh, divorce, uh, all kinds of things, really. Well, I suppose we are um, an alternative voice yes. in terms of the media. I don't think we're necessarily alternative in terms of the number of people out there who, will, who might agree with our position on various things. And people will agree with some things and not with others. Yes. Uh, and I think that's important to remember in the debate about abortion. Not all people who are pro-life think the exact same thing about everything else. Uh, so, you know, I could share the same views with somebody about on this issue of abortion, on the pro-life issue, but we might have different views about politics, about marriage, about all kinds of other yes. things. Um, and I think there is a tendency in the media to try to, um, I suppose, make a stereotype out yes. of people who, who are pro-life or anti-abortion, um, which is... And that comes not through. true and yeah. is unfair, uh, but is one of the tactics that's often used by those on the other side of the debate to try to discredit, um, you know, the person to play the man rather than the ball. Yeah, indeed. And um, you don't have to use football, man. <laughs> but it's a good one. You might like that one. No, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, I, it's very noticeable in television. Uh, Debates on mm. radio programs, mm. popular radio programs, and of course in the print media, mm. that um, people uh, who are pro-life are generally on the back foot. Do you feel that? Personally, no. No, you. I you're don't apologise for my views. I at know all. you don't. That's why <laughs> I invited you to do the podcast <laughs> because you are very, very. And I think uh, I think a pro-life a pro-life position. I am anti-abortion, mm. but a pro-life position is actually larger than just simply being anti-abortion. I think it is a more positive um, um, approach to, I suppose, a view of humanity. Of can you elaborate life. on that? Well, um, the act of abortion is. Um, a terrible injustice to 
the child in the womb. In my view, it's also an injustice to the woman um, because it is a trauma. And nobody ever talks about, don't, doesn't like to talk about the reality of what is entailed in abortion. And for those people who are anti-abortion or pro-life who try to do so, they're kind of regarded as gauche and, you know, an embarrassment. Um, but the reality of what happens in an abortion um, and the actual killing of a completely innocent human being is what people will be asked to vote on if the politicians put this to us. And it's something that everybody has to consider very carefully, I think, the reality. So not in some abstract sense, um, uh, but the reality of what is actually entailed. So I am anti-abortion in that sense, but I'm pro-life in the sense that, um, and actually our constitution is too, very often, I mean, you started at the, the, the top there, um, Eamon, where you mentioned about Leo Varadkar in uh, Canada. And he said, uh, reported that he said that uh, he updated the Prime Minister on uh, the government's plans to have a referendum next year to give the people of Ireland the opportunity to remove our constitutional ban on abortion should they wish to do so. Now, I'm a little concerned that our Taoiseach isn't au fait with our constitution because there is no constitutional ban on abortion. There is a legislative, legislative restriction on abortion. But actually, when you look at the Eighth Amendment or Article 43.3 of the Constitution, what it says is that it acknowledges, uh, the state acknowledges the right to life of the child before birth, just the same as the state acknowledges the right to life of the child after yeah, birth. Yeah, I mean, there's a, I have it here in front of me. Yes. There is a caveat. The state acknowledges the right to life of the unborn and with due regard to the equal right to life of the mother guarantees in its laws to respect and as far as practicable uh, by its laws to defend and vindicate that right. And I think that's a really um, reasonable and really moderate approach to take. And it leaves it, but it, it is open to interpretation, is it not? Well, and it, it, it creates difficulties. For well, example, well, I think when when it when it was when the people voted on it uh, back in the nineteen eighties everybody understood or thought they understood what they were voting for the Supreme Court subsequently interpreted it in a way that I don't think anybody could have reasonably in, you know thought when they voted on it that it might be interpreted that way but, but it was but, an but amendment I incidentally uh, I should point out to our listeners um, introduced by uh, Charles Hawhey uh, Fine Gael were in government mm -hmm. uh, Peter Sutherland the Attorney General at the time warned Gareth Fitzgerald that he, this should not be put into the Constitution because it would um, cause the kind of difficulties that we've actually seen. Mm. And in fact, Alan Shatter, in a speech in the Dáil at that time, said it might lead to legislation that would allow abortion. Yes. Uh, there were people who, who said that at the time. And th this is, in fact, where we've found ourselves. And there were Can generally people who were in favour of abortion. <laughs> but nonetheless... Well, let's just get to the, the this imminent political debate, which yeah. will be uh, well, well, if I could so just, important. If I, yeah. if I could just say why, because we will be asked to vote, it seems, on this particular article, the, the, the Eighth yeah, Amendment. Repeal, repeal the Eighth Amendment yes. uh, will be the, the question. It's a constitutional referendum. And then, of course, there is... Um, a natural follow-up to that, yeah. legislate. But I, I think there is a lot of confusion out there as to exactly what the Eighth Amendment is. So what the Eighth Amendment says is, do your best to protect both lives. And it takes a very moderate approach. It recognises that if the life of the mother is under threat, obviously the life of the baby is too. And so a doctor should do all he or she can to save both lives, but if in trying to attempt to save the life of the mother, the baby dies as a consequence, that is a completely morally different action from deliberately targeting the life of a child. So, the Catholic as I said, the, 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 the Constitution recognises a right to life. It doesn't ban abortion as such. Now, it follows from the fact that the baby has a right to life that that child also has a right not to be killed. And so the legislation sits, I suppose, underneath the, the constitutional framework. And 
up until 2013, it was the 1861 Act that outlawed uh, abortion. And now the 2013 Act um, has uh, does allow for abortion, but in restrictive, supposedly restricted circumstances. Yes. Uh, is the teaching of the Catholic Church central to your belief? Yes and no. So I'm a practicing Catholic. I've never hidden that fact. Um, And because of my Catholicism and my um, Christian beliefs that um, we all have, I suppose, um, a common heritage, I think that that's, that's where I see the equal value in everybody that we're all created by God. We are not all created equal. We only have to look around us to know that some people are, you know, disabled. Some people do not have the same um, financial abilities. Some people don't have the same IQ, don't have the same other talents. We're not all equal in that sense. But one of the really important things in any civilized society is that the law treats us all as though we're equal. And so part of that in me comes from my Catholic belief, but it also comes from my belief as a citizen of this state that it is a fair and just approach to take. And I don't believe that you have to be a Catholic or a Christian or a person of any belief to come to that conclusion. I think a person of no faith can come to the conclusion that we should the law should treat us all equal because we only have to look around and see throughout history but also right around the world as we are speaking what terrible just injustices can result when some people are treated as less than others most people believe maria uh, that i know uh, that the law does not treat um, everybody in this country equal Mm. and in fact to assert that it did would be regarded as perverse But you see, if that's the case, we can recognise that that's wrong. We have recognised it, but nobody has campaigned to um, right the inherent injustice in our in our courts, uh, the way people are treated. um, Regard, it's not regardless of your class. Mm. It's not regardless of your means. Mm. It very much depends Mm. uh, on your means what kind of justice you can buy. Well, I, I think just that's, may, I, I think say that's that wrong. In I, mean, I, I think you that's don't wrong. Think that's the case? I, I think I think it's wrong that that people would not be treated equally, in that sense, and that uh, you know, some because of the, the family that you're born into, you would suffer a prejudice because you're you don't have the financial means. I think that's wrong, and I think it's something that people should be aware of in the context of this debate as well, yes. because abortion targets the children from poor families disproportionately there is a strong eugenics culture underlying the whole industry of abortion if you look in the states there is a disproportionate number of abortion clinics in um, ethnic minority neighborhoods so for instance the biggest killer of black lives in america is not hiv not diabetes not cancer not heart disease it's abortion Abortion, the number of deaths of black people through abortion outnumbers all other deaths in black people combined. I mean, isn't that a frightening statistic? There's not a frightening uh, prospect. I was speaking to somebody and I told them I was going to interview this morning. Um, and they said that in Denmark, where abortion is yeah. um, practiced widely, that they boast that... Uh, in the next 20 years, they'll have no Down syndrome children. That's right. And like at the first reading... Uh, which is rather it, frightening. Well, at the first reading of it, it sounds like, gosh, they found a cure for this. But no, oh. it's that they're just killing everybody with the condition. Yeah. And I don't know if you saw the Sally Phillips documentary. No. It was a really beautiful documentary by uh, the actress Sally Phillips, who has a son um, with Down syndrome. And she was really disturbed um, when she looked into it uh, about the fact that in the UK where she lives over 90% of children with Down syndrome are aborted in Iceland the rate is 100% yes 100% now how can people who call themselves human rights advocates 
kind of ignore this? How, wh- wh- what is it about their, they have, seem to have a blind spot when it comes to this, that people with disabilities are regarded as so awful that we have to abort them before they're born? To go back to um, the Eighth Amendment, uh, the Citizens' Convention, mm. um, which I think is an entirely unsatisfactory way of making law mm. or deciding anything. Mm. You pick 100 people from the phone book, you put them in a room with people with some expertise, and in the case of abortion, uh, which they just considered uh, in the past 12 months, um, they came out with a finding that was extremely liberal, ultra-liberal, I would have thought, by a majority of something like 75, 25. Mm. Um, And what do you make of that, Maria? Um, I think that for all the terrible waste of taxpayers' money that was involved in conducting that Citizens' Assembly. Um, I think that the Citizens' Assembly is to be congratulated for one thing, and that is that they have finally revealed, you know, the true parameters of this debate in all its gory detail. Um, Basically, the mask has slipped. And so what we see is that there are people in this country who are willing to write off every right a child has before birth. Despite the fact, as far as I can see, there's no difference in the moral status of that child before or after birth. It's just a matter of geography, whether he or she is inside the mother's womb or not. Now, another statistic that seems to me to be very relevant is that 25% of women in this country are estimated to have had what are called unwanted pregnancies. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, many of them will have had uh, abortion. Mm. Uh, They will have Mm travelled to England Mm. uh, to have the abortion. But it's a very large figure, a a very large percentage. Um, Where are these people on the moral spectrum, if you like? If there is a moral spectrum. Well, it's not my place to judge anyone else. I wouldn't like somebody to judge me, so I try not to do the same for other people. Um, uh, That's not my place. Um, But I think that it is possible... But it's the state's role, is it not, to legislate uh, for those people as well as uh, the other 75%. I I think it is possible to make a judgment about the moral quality of an action without being judgmental about the person. And actually, I think that's very important to do it that way. Um, Because the fact is, we all make bad choices. We all make decisions. None of us is without blame in our lives at some point or other. Um, So I do not for a second uh, judge any woman who's had an abortion. But having said that, I think it's important to say that the action of killing a child deliberately is wrong. Now, very often, and I know this from um, the testimonies I've heard, uh, from testimonies I've read from women on the internet and people that I have spoken to who've had abortions, that very often they actually didn't really know what they were letting themselves in for. That there was a cover-up in terms of what kind of information they were given. Um, For instance, it is practice in abortion clinics throughout the world that when a woman goes for an abortion, obviously an ultrasound scan has to be done to make sure there's a baby there. Um, But the screen is turned away from the woman because they rightly think that if she sees the screen, she might just change her mind. And that's actually, you know, that that sense really struck me. I mean, I've always been pro-life, but it wasn't until I was expecting my first child and I thought I was going to lose him. And I had to go into the hospital uh, when he was about 11 weeks, so about nine weeks after conception. And um, they did a scan and I could see him on the screen and I could see his little arms and legs kicking about and waving about and I fell in love with him. And it was then that the injustice of abortion really struck me, how the reality of it really struck me. And I thought, you know, that's why 
they don't let women who are contemplating abortion see their babies because they might fall in love with them too. The and the thing about it is, you mentioned unwanted pregnancies. I have friends who had children in less than ideal circumstances, but not one of them regrets having their baby. You know, and that's the thing that, that is often that I worry about for young girls and women who might be listening to these debates in the media. Um, pregnancy and motherhood and having a child is kind of couched in such negative terms but actually those of us who are parents know the joys and the fulfillment it brings it doesn't mean it's easy all the time but like my god it's it's the most fulfilling thing I've ever done in my life and um, it has changed my life but in my view for the better the thing about it is abortion doesn't undo a pregnancy and I can understand you know a young girl or woman feeling like I just want to turn back time panicked you know that she's pregnant and not knowing what the future holds I can completely understand that but abortion is not going to undo that pregnancy and once that child is in being the world is never the same again because a new human being is in the world but that doesn't have to be a frightening thing or a negative thing and I wish that people could be more positive and encourage girls and women who find themselves in difficult situations to say, you know what, your sadness and anxiety is not going to last forever. There will come a day where you feel pride and joy in your baby and in yourself for what you've done in giving life to your baby and bringing him or her into the world. That's a big ask, uh, Maria, for somebody who is in circumstances where they simply cannot manage. Uh, I, I'm not... I understand it, that, it, Eamon, There but, are overwhelming situations. I, I, there are, and, man, they are, and they are rare, it has to be yeah. said, because most women, when they see their babies for the first time, when their babies are born, most women want to raise the child themselves. Now, there are circumstances where, for whatever reason, and again, I'm not going to judge anybody on the decisions they make in terms of why they could feel they can't raise a child. But there is the option of adoption. And that is never talked about in this debate. And there are so many couples in this country who are infertile and crying out for it, would do anything to be able to adopt a child. They have to go to the ends of the earth to try to find a child and wait for years. And yet we are shipping off three, over 3,000 women every year that means over 3,000 Irish babies are dying every year that could be placed in loving homes. Uh, the Catholic teaching on um, this at one point um, insisted that if the choice had to be made to save the life of the child or the mother, it would have to ch change it saved the life of the child. Now, I've heard that before, Eamon, but can you point to me where the Catholic Church ever said that? No. <laughs> <laughs> because I have never, ever found that in any church document, ever. We will uh, pass <laughs> on that, but I, I mean, it was, I think... Uh, I, I, a fact was, of was, Irish life. It was an old wives' tale, and maybe people did say that, but I have never seen any evidence in any church document that that was the case. Well, let's, I, I'll accept that. Um, let's um, go to the X case, which was, you know, uh, a fundamental moment in this whole um, debate. Here was a 14-year-old girl who had been a victim of rape. And because of um, the Eighth Amendment, uh, the High Court said she couldn't uh, go to England to have an abortion. Mm. The Supreme Court overturned that and ruled that she could. Mm. Um, the um, question that arises is how could a child be expected to carry a baby mm as a result of rape mm. uh, in any sensible, decent society. Mm. Mm. And it's a, it's a question that 
uh, I think it's incumbent on people of your persuasion to address. I'm really happy to address it and I have thought long and hard about this. Um, First of all, I mean, I suppose the fundamental question is, do you believe that what is growing inside that girl's womb is a human being? Do I? Yeah. Of course. Okay. I I think there is a a question that arises about uh, in this area Mm. of when uh, it becomes a human being. Okay, well, if you just just for for one minute... In the moment after conception. Yeah. um, Or in the weeks after conception. But when when we're talking about... When we're talking about abortion... Yes. We're not talking about the moments after conception. No, of course. Because we're talking about Mm. the point... The girl... Like, there is no test that a woman can take immediately after conception that will tell her that she's pregnant. Yes. She is it, only in, within a matter of weeks where the hormones have risen yes. that she will be able to identify that she's pregnant, at which point the baby is well on its way developing. Now, you, so you, the, the question is, do you see the child in the womb as a child, as a human being? And, and obviously, I think you'd probably agree that human being is completely innocent. Yes, or would you? but I, I'm thinking of the so four, 14 is it year fair? Old I know, child. But, but there are two victims here. So that that child who was raped was that was so wrong. And I think that the punishment should be dealt out with the full rigor of the law on the man who did it, not on another innocent child who has to pay for her father's crime. Do you think do you honestly think it's fair? In what other circumstance would we allow an innocent person to receive the death penalty for somebody else's crime. Well, that's... Um, Can you think of any other circumstances? I, I would say that, that language is extreme. But why is I, it extreme? Because I think the phrase death penalty... Okay, does has the a child... Certain, well, no, just let does me the child finish. die uh, in an abortion? It has a certain connotation. Yes. That th- there is a deliberate uh, murder... Okay. Of no, the, the, and this word has been used yep. uh, by people on pro life side. Yep. This is murder, that this is a death penalty. Uh, now, I am personally, but, but the child is having to pay, so that's a penalty. And the child, well, this is what comes is to the killed, crux of it, so cu- is brought yeah. to the stage of death. So, ha- wh- what is extreme about calling it a death penalty? What is extreme or immoderate about saying innocent people shouldn't be killed? Well. Because then we get to the definition of a person. When but you're after saying you agree it's a person. I agree at a certain point. At what point? Well, I don't know, Maria, and neither do you, with respect. Well, because you, there's a lot of things that... But there's only one logical Well, no, Well, point, let me just point there? out that you need to have consciousness. You need. Do to you? What about a person you who need is to unconscious? Have does that make them... Unhu- what about a person who loses consciousness? No, no. Or a you person who's in a coma, are they no person, longer human? To, If you take this 14-year-old girl mm. who had this terrible ordeal mm. visited upon her, she mm. is innocent. She is totally innocent. Right. And so now, is her baby. So, yeah, but the, And the man is guilty. And all abortion does in these circumstances is mm. take the focus off the wrongdoer no, that's not I would much case. prefer to see us focusing. Well, the two things aren't um, on, on, on on more strict uh, yeah. sentencing for men who carry out crimes well, like that. With the greatest respect, Maria, the two things aren't mutually exclusive. You can um, visit on the man responsible for this uh, the full rigor of the law, mm. but you still have you still left with a fourteen-year-old, fifteen-year-old child. Yes carrying the baby well, well, of, a, of a man I've considered who violated okay, her well, can I in the most... Well, let, let me just yeah. f- frame the question. Okay. Violated her in the most appalling way. And it seems to me... Uh, and my position is not unsympathetic mm. to your arguments. Mm. It seems to me that that uh, must be revol- resolved in favour of that 14, 15-year-old girl mm. and... She should not be asked uh, to compound the rape, the violation, with 
the trauma of bearing a child. Well, you see, I kind of, I agree I mean, with you up to a point. I agree with you up to a point because I have a daughter and I've thought about this. And I would be concerned that for any girl in that circumstance, that the, the trauma and the force that was used on her is because of the rape, not because of the child in her womb. And to put her through another trauma, which is an abortion, I would be much more concerned that a girl of that age would not deal well with an abortion on top of a rape. And but, that but if she, she had the proper the, supports sorry. of her parents and all those around her to help her through the pregnancy and to have the baby, and if she wishes to keep the baby and raise the baby with the help of whoever is around her, um, or to give the child up for adoption, that that that, that is something good and something beautiful that can be brought out of a horrible and fundamentally immoral situation that has been visited upon her. Okay, well let's look at so, this so the, from her so perspective. I know somebody I know somebody who was raped in very difficult circumstances where basically by a complete stranger. Ambushed by a stranger and she became pregnant. And she made the decision to have her baby uh, and that wasn't easy because of she was a student at the time and in a relationship and all kinds of other things but she had her baby and one of the thing that really upsets me about this element of the debate is people refer to the child as a rapist baby like how would you force a girl to carry a rapist baby that reminds me of the kind of language that was used years ago when people talked about illegitimate children and they put the actions of their parents the child had to carry that around for the rest of their lives well, which was so fact, wrong I didn't use that language no 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 I'm not saying you did I, but, I, I, but in the past that was what was so but it's a similar kind of thing the, the child in the womb is not a rapist baby the child is I just as much no I know I'm saying other people have yeah. in the in the context of this debate the child is very much the mother's baby too but more importantly than that the child is a person in his or her own right that child can't be blamed for the circumstances of his or her conception any more than the mother can be blamed for the rape that has been visited on her okay let's so we're dealing with two question. completely innocent people well let's go to the question of free will it was the girl who and her family mm -hmm. who sought relief mm -hmm. from our legal system and eventually in the supreme court court they got the relief that they were seeking yes which was the a relief from this dreadful trauma. I mean, let's... But was it? Well, Did it undo the rape? I don't think so. Well, hold on. Let's just... It wasn't a relief suppose, from the trauma. Suppose the I, High I think Court that's ruling unfair to say. had been... Well, suppose the High Court ruling had been upheld in the Supreme Court. She would have had a baby at the age of 15. Mm. And, and lots of women in this country have no, had. but can you imagine? And love their babies her, and are really her, proud of them. Her education, her neighbourhood, her friends... Uh, would she be capable at the age of 15 of being a mother because you have to nurture there are things you have to do I mean, to me, there's no doubt about it well, motherhood I, makes you grow up well, I mean I think that's a bit rich for a 15 year old to be asked no uh, well it, it, it is it is not ideal I will but but there again it very much depends on the girl in question on the supports she has on the family and all of that but ultimately what it comes down to and this is the fundamental question are we willing to be a society that says to a girl like that you know your baby is dispensable we'll sort this out and then you'll be cured of whatever you know trauma you've gone through that still ignore it's, it's not like abortion is a cure for rape it's not and in, in many circumstances it compounds the suffering that the girl has already gone through um, and so are we willing to be a society that says I'm going to stand by you you're going to be okay you're going to be a great mother and if you decide that you're not able to we'll find somebody else to raise the child because this child is important too both lives matter the picture you're painting now is of an innocent child mm. violated in the most appalling way possible, mm. seeking 
from society some relief from for her future some escape well, well, from, how, uh, how is how is providing her with an abortion going to give her relief or escape from the trauma that has happened no, to her it will give her it will give her relief I mean that's not um, the way it, it works for women well, who just, have been attacked no but just uh, if we take I know hard cases make bad law by the way yeah and I accept that yeah and I, that's why but, I but I'm also talking about the individual case of the girl I'm, try, I'm, I'm trying to get to get us onto the same page here I see a 15 year old girl with her life in ruins with a baby which looks uh, to her neighbours her friends her schoolmates with uh, really her life totally altered forever I think that's a very extreme way think to having a it. baby at 15 well, well, as like a it, result of a rape well, like won't alter your life forever I, I know colleagues who had babies as teenagers and are now practicing barristers didn't didn't set them back they were able to deal with it they they pursued their education and their career mm. and their children are their pride and joy like it doesn't r having a child is not that's the end of really your life that's really unconvincing anecdotal uh, stuff Maria because but do you honestly think that having a child ruins your life Eamon when you're 14 yes do you I think so why I think there's a large chance that it will because you're not prepared for example you have to go through puberty you have to go through adolescence you have to have well, if a girl has conceived she has already well gone you have to continue developing as a human being yes you have to uh, go and do your exams do your studies you have to be able to go out of your home uh, with face your neighbors uh, not be but this is not the 1950s it's not like the social opprobrium for having a baby outside of wedlock I think it was 1982 actually or but 1992 but the point is this but, but society is not like that at all now okay well I let our listeners sort of make their own mind up uh, on that particular case mm. uh, I have to point out that when that proposition was put to the people again in a referendum people supported the Supreme Court judgment well, not, not by many I have to say no they did yes no any time yeah. any time the question has been put to the people to change the law on the Eighth Amendment they have rejected it no they it, this um, I can I have the paper here the, the, the there was another there were three further yes. subsequent referendums yes. as you know yes and the we now come to uh, a fourth referendum yes. the eighth amendment itself what you want to retain it is that the argument yes. you'll be making yes and for example the question of well Savita Halepanova is a horror story and I think it changed people's perceptions and attitudes in this country mm. she asked for termination she was 17 weeks pregnant she died of sepsis septicemia she was told in Galway in the Galway hospital she was in by a senior uh, medical person there's a nurse nurse yes yes and I have her name right there yeah and she was told this is a Catholic country yes uh, nine people were uh, disciplined mm. by the subsequent inquiry and tribunal and and, uh, and, and this is a terrible case listen, Maria, that listen see, it tends to tends to make me feel um, that there is there are extremist views in play here that to say to us to a, a dying woman a sick woman who is in this country you know as an immigrant that this is a Catholic country I think it was a very unfortunate choice of words and um, I think it was also a, a misunderstanding of what the law actually is but I think more than that um, th the case of the really tragic case of Savita Halepanavar has been um, misstated in the media because 
the various reviews that were carried out all found that her death was due to negligence. Now, that is a real tragedy that in our hospitals, whether it be for lack of facilities, uh, lack of um, you know, doctors and nurses who are on call at the right time and failure to follow basic medical practices that would have spotted that she was getting into trouble earlier on. She died because of negligence, well, not because she didn't have an abortion. Now, well, and, if she had the termination when she asked for it, it is generally accepted. That, that is not generally accepted. It is accepted. And nobody can prove that. Nobody can prove that. That poor woman and her baby died because of negligence, because she wasn't looked after well enough in the hospital she was in. Well, Dr. Peter and there are Boylan, pe- for example, the former Dr. master Peter Boylan of... Is, is, is a former campaigner master. for abortion rights in this country. He said he's a former master of Hall Street. He is, but he's also, he also campaigns what for he, abortion rights. But what he said about that case, and he gave evidence, was that medical professionals in circumstances that are unusual and difficult mm. are afraid that because of the laws that exist yes. and the penalties that are so severe... Yes, I remember that. ...that... Why should um, the, the med- medical people, nurses, midwives, and someone as eminent as Dr. Boylan, why should they be afraid? Why can we not clarify this? Well, well that argument is, with all due respect to Dr. Boylan, uh, is completely bogus. There has never been a prosecution of a doctor in this state. Uh, for trying to save a woman's life where the child dies Mm. as a consequence of that. That is a fundamentally different thing from uh, deliberately attacking a child so as to bring an end to that child's life. So there are two totally different actions on the part of the doctor. And I think that the law is right in holding doctors to account and saying you can't directly and intentionally kill because the whole point about the law intent is a fundamental part of the criminal law so insofar as doctors are going to be held accountable it has to be shown that they intended deliberately to kill the child the phrase that um, and that has that has never been the case there has never there is no, no threat over doctors or nurses and doctors and nurses for for the last number of decades have been perfectly able to handle cases where they have to make interventions and sometimes the baby dies but nobody's going to blame them for okay. that okay well let me that's not an abortion quote to you what was said to uh Savita Harbanavar by a clinical midwife manager she was told that first of all the hospital dishonestly said that this had not this had, this incident hadn't taken place and the coroner insisted uh and yes, uh, the midwife manager said, I did say this is a Catholic country. Now, what has that got to do? It has nothing to do with anything. I don't know why she said it. I really don't. Well, I, I, I think let's just explore for a moment why she might have said it. Well, it, it could She be. might have believed yes. that the culture of this country and particularly in her responsible position as a, a, a manager and midwife, that abortion uh, or termination was something that carried a heavy penalty or that was morally uh, wrong. Well, who knows what was in her head when she said it. Um, the point is, I don't think she should have said it, but it was irrelevant to the, the, the case in hand. You know, I mean, I think most people would probably agree at this stage it's been a long time since Ireland was a Catholic country but whether uh, whether it is or not the fact is the law of the state applies to what interventions can be done and if there was a real and substantial risk to the life of Savita Halepanavar the doctors should have intervened to save her life and the life of her baby 
uh, what they didn't. Determination they didn't intervene. Would, would have been the first step in that process. But a, a, like a termination, what do you mean by termination? Do you mean like an abortion as in directly taking the life of the child? That's not going to cure her of sepsis, mm. is it? Well, it's the language, you see, of... Uh, well, that's what she died of. She died of, of sepsis. sepsis. Yeah. Yeah. But it had to be treated. But killing the child was not going to treat the sepsis. No, but killing the child would have um, allowed, or killing the child, child is, a, is words uh, that you've chosen to use, mm. terminating the pregnancy, which is, I think, if you were to use that language, mm. Uh, you'd be more correct. Well, terminating every, every pregnancy death. terminates, Eamon. Yes. So every ter pregnancy terminates, usually mm. at nine months, mm. with the birth of a live baby. Yes. So every pregnancy comes to an end. It, it is euphemistic language on the part of those who, who support the introduction of abortion to call an abortion termination of pregnancy. Because mm. it's not, it's actually the termination of a life. The all preg Pregnancy is just a state of being and all pregnancies terminate. But to terminate a life is a very different thing. So is there any um, circumstance at all? I mean, the, the other one that... I mean, I'm fundamentally against abortion. And I'd be quite conservative in my values. I'm against divorce, for mm -hmm. example. Um, the... Uh, there incest is a crime of beyond the appalling vista. Uh, and again, I, I admit that the hard cases make bad law. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, I, but I, I understand what you mean about just that. But inhuman, it seems to me, to insist that a girl, a child, a teenager, who is a victim of an incestuous rape, Mm. be made to carry to full term that baby. Now and explain that to me. Well, and yet one of the girls who that actually happened to um, uh, gave testimony and gave an interview, I think, uh, saying that having her baby actually helped her in the healing process. That was her own testimony. Um, but when you talk about the hard cases, it's interesting because very often when people are talking about introducing legislation, they bring up the hard cases. Yeah. But if you were to ask That's people... That's why I've made the point I know, against my own and the, argument. And the people, if you were to ask the people who are seeking to, ha to repeal the Eighth Amendment, are they willing to limit abortion mm. to those hard cases? They won't say yes. No, I know. If you mean. ask them, are you willing to outlaw it in the case of Down syndrome? they won't say, yes, we'll outlaw abortion for babies with Down syndrome. Because ultimately, they don't really care about the hard cases. Well, the hard cases are just a ruse to get abortion in. And once it's in, then all bets are off. And that's the thing about the Eighth Amendment. Because we don't have a constitutional ban on abortion, we have a constitutional right to life. If that is repealed, even if the government says, we'll only legislate for very restrictive circumstances. Once the constitutional yes. protection is gone, yes. they're free to legislate five years down the line, one year, six months down the line, they yes. can bring in totally wide range abortion. Yeah. So if you're concerned that Ireland may go down the route of the UK, where, for instance, did you know, like how many abortions would you say happen in the UK? Would you say it's one in 30, one in 20, one in 10, one in five? I don't know the answer. But it's one in five, Eamon. Yes. One yes. in five yes. of all babies in the yes. UK are aborted. Yes. In Sweden, it's one in four. Yes. Now, do you want... I don't want that. So if you don't want that... In Italy, there's if a massive Whoever problem. doesn't want that has to vote against whatever government proposal is being brought in. Because whatever it is, whether they'll dress it up saying, well, it's not repeal, it's replace or it's amend... That's kind of irrelevant because whether it's appeal, uh, you know, amend, um, remove, it all involves repeal yes. the, the law that's there at the moment. So, um, but, and as I said, once that constitutional protection is gone, there is nothing to stop a government in future, the Oireachtas, from legislating uh, for um, wide ranging abortion. So, 
um, there is no um, wriggle room. Yours well, what is do you a, mean by wriggle room? Well, uh, what I mean is, it, in some some cases, yeah. somebody like me, yeah. uh, who is, as I said before, conservative uh, culturally and socially, um, would find the prospect of a victim of rape mm. or incest carrying a child, being made to carry a child, mm. uh, when they may, and I say may, as in the X case, be suicidal, that 14-year-old girl testified that she was suicidal. Now, I know that's, you know... Um, but, but uh, see, I f I, I even find the National Women's Council of Ireland don't want to bring in abortion in circumstances of rape because they know it's unworkable. Like, what are you going to do? Get the woman to have to prove that she was raped and wait for a court trial? The baby will be long born. So they don't want that. They actually don't want abortion to be brought in on the circum under the circumstances of rape. Um, but, but ultimately, what you're talking about, again, to get back to it, is... It's a humane you know, it's, it's, answer. I understand, I understand that the, the sense that some people have, well, like, we have to give a little or there has to be some compromise. But compromising on abortion is not like compromising on anything else. Because what it means is that necessarily some children will lose their lives. Is that a compromise that you're willing to make to have on your conscience when you go into the voting booth? Is that that is what a compromise means? Yes, I understand. And that and that we basically we create a kind of subclass of human beings who do not deserve the same protection as all the rest of us have. So all the rest of us have our, our, our right to life is protected by the state, and the state will vindicate our rights from unjust attack. But if we change this, what we're saying is that there are certain human beings, whether it's because they have a, an illness or they don't look right or their IQ isn't up to much or because they come from poor families we're in or whatever. Eugenics it is. and Hitler now territory. Well, well, well we there, are. there is a real eugenics culture. Yes, I know. I've said, like, the, uh, and I think that's, that's why I don't support it. Exactly. And when you look to Iceland, 100%, as I said, yeah. of babies with Down syndrome are aborted. So that is really creating a subclass of human beings that are not worthy of the same protection and rights as everybody else. Is that the way we want our society to go? Uh, final question. Uh, it's not the way I want this society to go, <laughs> no. Um, is your conviction, your belief, um, informed by your Catholicism and the Catholic view on this? Well, I've said, I, I said that earlier. I said yes and no. I have... You, well, I, I'm asking you now, yeah, is again, it yes or no? Well, it's both, because I, I... But I think it's possible to have both, to, to have um, a faith side yes. aspect to your personality. And for me, I believe that God has created us all. And for that reason, nobody has the right to take what is a gift from God from them, the right to life from them. So that's with my Catholic hat on. But also as a citizen of this country, uh, with, with my secular hat on in that sense, um, I can see that I don't want our society going down a route whereby some human beings are less valued than others because there is something wrong with them or simply because they're unwanted. I think that's a really sad basis on which to deprive somebody of their humanity. Like the idea that somebody is unwanted, like everybody's wanted by somebody, but more importantly than that, you know, are we really saying whether somebody is wanted or popular, you know, their, their personhood is going to be deprived of them because of that. And I think I would be really sad if our society went down that route. I think we can offer much more positive and better options to women who are in difficult circumstances to encourage them. Sometimes all we need is a little bit of encouragement and support to get us through. And it has to be remembered as well, you know, pregnancy and I've had four and believe me, I, they haven't been easy for me, but, you know, it is a temporary state of being compared to the terrible finality of ending an innocent child's life. So for the time that a woman is pregnant, I think we should all be rushing to support her and make life easier for her, whether that's 
standing up on the bus to give somebody your seat or looking after your sister who's pregnant or, you know, going to the doctor with your uh, daughter or friend or whoever it is to support them right through. Um, And I think if everybody in our society did that, we'd be living in a much nicer place and a much happier place for pregnant women. People on the left would say it would be great uh, if it was like that after you were born. Yeah. And it isn't. Well, I do what I can in my small, own small way. No, but way. You, you concede that it isn't. Well, it, it depends. For I mean, some, some people, some people it, it, it do suffer terribly. Yeah. But we can recognise that that is wrong and we can try to do something about it. Like, that's the difference. It's the recognition of injustice and trying to do something about it, as opposed to saying, you know what, we can see it's unjust to kill an innocent child, but we're not going to do anything about it. We're going to let it happen because, frankly, it's easier for us. OK, Maria, um, it's been really interesting. Uh, and thank you very much. For thank talking you. To us. That's Maria Steen, who is a spokesperson for the Iona Institute. You will see a lot of her in the coming months. Uh, being berated by Vincent Brown and others, but not here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Check out Paddy Power's new and exclusive Cash Card Plus, available to use online, at ATMs, or even down the local. Paddy Power, you beauty. Hello and welcome to the Monday Postcast with me, Maddie Plow. I've been joined by Nick Watts, Tom Segal and Paul Binfield from Paddy Power. Well, what a weekend it was. Absolutely superb end to the jump racing season. A brilliant climax at Punchestown and Sandown. Um, but we've, all, of course, also had some really exciting and informative classic trials this week to get our teeth stuck into. Um, starting with you, Nick, did you have a good profitable weekend? How was it? It was all right, actually. Yeah, not too bad. I, I did something I very rarely do, and I, I, I backed Willie Mullins a few weeks ago to retain his title, and I, I thought it all slipped away at one stage oh, last week bravo. after Nichols Canyon got beat, but somehow he managed to wrestle it around, so it wasn't too bad. Yeah, extraordinary. Um, Tom, how was your weekend? Uh, it got better on Sunday. It was all right for most of it. I, sh- I, I felt like I was in the zone for, for Punchestown, but I did a sort of as badly as I possibly I won a few quid but I could I did as badly as I possibly could really despite having a few winners so it was a bit frustrating I sort of I felt I was there but nothing really happened and like like Nick one of the best results was Willie Mullins I think I I, I like him I backed Mm. him a few months ago and it's nice to see him sneak up he could have been so much better I mean if you think about Mullins this year he didn't have Votor or Forheen or any power and quite a few of the rich, Richie horses didn't perform, did they? So for him to come up, and, you know, late on and win, mm. amazing achievement. So we'll come back to the jumps, but let's start off with the 2,000 guineas. How do you bet, Paul, first off? Uh, well, we're 15 to 8 um, favourite Churchill, Maddie. Al Wu Care at, at 7 to 2. Richard Hannon's Barney Roy at 4 to 1. Eminent, who your paper's digging up today on the front page, 11 to 2. And then it's 14 to 1 bar. Okay, brilliant. Um, first off, do we think Churchill is beatable? And if so, who are we going to side with? Start with you, Nick. Yeah, I, I think he is beatable. Um, I, I don't like the price of him for a start. Um, and I know this time last year we talked about Air Force Blue like he was the second coming and, and he wasn't cited all season. So you're never quite sure with Aiden's horses if he is going to be brilliant or if he's going to be one of these... You know, Air Force Blue type horses. He was workman like last year. He wasn't. He, he never looked outstanding to me. He just kind of got the kept getting the I job agree, done. Yeah. Um, and I always go back to his Ascot win. You know, he won the Chesham at Royal Ascot, and nothing ever, any good normally comes out of the Chesham. Um, mm. I look back through his history, and no, you know, fantastic three-year-olds have ever won that race. So it might have been an above-average renewal last year because Kunko was third in it, and he won last week. So. And you can't blame the horse for, for going there and doing it. But nice. I thought the trials threw up some decent uh, alternatives to him. There was the French horse, Al I thought Eminent looked very good. And you've got the Godolphin to Barney Roy and Dreamcastle. So I think it's much more open than the betting suggests. Mm. 
I don't know about anyone else, but I watched that uh, Greenham and I just thought it looked like such a classy race. I um, really like the way Barney Roy went about it. It'll be interesting to see how their careers play out at this stage. Tom, anything tickle you fancy in the Guineas market? Well, I'm, well I, I backed or tipped uh, for the paper a few months ago. Alwu Care at a massive price. So I'm looking forward to seeing him. I am worried about very fast ground for him. He's by Dream Ahead and I'd be worried coming down the hill there. If he got very quick, but I think oh, the, the Farber boys are are very very keen on him he's got was, a great record at newmarket as well hasn't he He has and i was reading somewhere the other day harry herbert was saying that one of the, the main work riders for for andre Farber, who's been there for years and years and years thinks that alu care is the best horse he's ever ridden wow. you think you know they they really really love him but i you know it was something about him in the jebel was slightly disconcerting for me the way he got behind uh he's by dream ahead as i say whether he's not really fast ground i'm with you maddie i thought barney roy moved like a, a like a tremendous horse at, at newbury in the green and really got low very few horses move like he does he got really low and really stretched and i thought he would be my one as for churchill i just think he's a bad price i don't think he's beaten a good horse yet i can't believe uh, just, just going by aiden o'brien's sort of modus operandi he's, he's likely to want the horse to progress as the season goes mm. on now you can win a 2000 guineas like that he's done it many times but the horses have got better as the after the 2000 guineas and the difference between this and maybe camelots or henry the navigators or whatever it was this is a really really good race mm. those three trial winners are really really good for me if i was making a market for myself he'd be the fourth in for me he'd be the one i would yeah. fancy least of the four because I've seen them do win their trials, and so yeah. for me, he's a bad price. But I, look, I I'm, agree. I'm not, not saying he can't win because he's trained by Ed O'Brien, he's won every race, and he's by Galileos, but seven to four is wrong. Yeah, I think a lot of the time, as you say, Aidan O'Brien likes his horses to sort of progress naturally throughout their seasons. And Churchill, for me, in a lot of cases, I mean, you saw it with Order of St. George, fair enough, he was giving the others weight the other day, but I feel like he doesn't have them as ready as sometimes he can um, first time out. So like you i think at the prices having you know seen the trials and been quite impressed with the trials for both um this and the and the phillies version um i think it might be wise just to play alive to that a little bit um talking of the phillies we'll move on to the 1000 guineas on sunday um and whether aiden o'brien can win his third guineas in six years with rhododendron who won the phillies mile last year really impressively Again, if I could ask you for the betting pool, any thoughts you have on the 1,000 guineas as well? Um, and then we'll move on to, to our fancies in the race. Yeah, um, Rhoda Denver's 5-2 to two favourite. Fair Eva at eight, along with Dab Yar, who won for one of the trials for John Gosden. Daban on 8-1 to one as well. 10-1 to one Hydrangea and 12-1 to one Bar. Um, I th I'd, unlike you, you lot, I do think Churchill's unbeatable in the... Uh, 2,000 guineas, but I would take... We know what's going to happen on. then. <laughs> Sorry? We know what's going to happen then. He's going to go and win now. Well, you never know, but I, do, I, do, I think Rhoda Denvin's more takeable on. Um, she got beaten in the Moy Glab, ad admittedly on yielding ground, but it, the, the two in front of her, 25 to 1, and O'Brien's third string, so I'd take her on. Um, John Gosden, two strong, strong, strong arrows. It looks like... Um, Daban's going to be his one in England, and Dabyar will go to France. Um, and at eight to one, I think Daban is is a nice each way price to to make the frame. Yeah, I totally agree. I think she probably didn't get enough credit for her win in the Nelgwyn. She does need to improve, but equally, you know, she's very inexperienced. She did that really well. Nick, what's your? Thoughts? Yeah, she did. She did do very well. Um, I mean, what we said about Churchill, it pertains to rhododendron as yeah, well. In that yeah. It's her first, you know, aiming to win it on, on a seasonal return. And I'm sure she'll get better as the season progresses. Um, some of these have been winning trials. One who hasn't, which I'm interested in, is Fair Eva, Roger Charlton's horse. Because she looked an absolutely world beater to me when, you know, she won her first two starts last season. Um, the wheels came off a bit on the last two. She was beating the odds on both times. But I'm convinced she, you know, we didn't see the best of her. And she's better than she showed there. And... It's just interesting Roger Charlton is happy to go there. He didn't feel he needed a trial for her. He's going straight there. There seems to be an underlying bit of confidence behind her. Mm. Um.